to just get started, would you like to introduce yourself as far as how you got into martial arts, what sort of martial arts background you got, and then how you came to work in the industry? Sure. Hi, my name's Chris Mark. We met briefly on the other phone. <laughs> that didn't go so well. Um, but my background is I'm a martial artist, um, an acrobat. I do a little bit of parkour and a sport or art that's called tricking. And I first got into martial arts uh, when I was 14 years old. So I started a little late. I took karate. And then from there, I learned about the world of extreme martial arts and performance oriented martial arts, doing like acrobatic kicks and flips with kicks and double spins with kicks. And my love for that kind of art form took off. And I ended up joining a team called Team Ryuko, which is a live stage performance team. And we also made viral videos back in the day. And through live stage performance, doing martial arts and acrobatics, I met people and I eventually got into film and television as a stunt performer. And then after doing that for probably eight, eight, nine years, um, I got more into acting and I kind of fell in love with acting and the world of acting and the process that goes behind acting. And so right now I work as an actor, I work as a fight choreographer and I work as a stunt performer. So when it comes to getting the jobs that you've been getting, if you are going to appear on a project, whether it's a show or a film, and you're booked as both an actor and as some sort of stunt performer, do you have to go through two separate hiring processes or do they just know that you're coming in for both at the same time? Usually on the stunt side, you're, you're okay. Like there's no sort of audition process. So it's always on the acting side. So for example, I worked on the boys as blind spot and the stunt coordinator saw the breakdown in the script. And he saw that, uh, you know, this, this character does acrobatics and this and that. And originally they were going to cast somebody and, and get a stunt double. And he suggested to them, Oh, I know a guy who can do the acting and the stunts and he's really good. And so then he referred me to them and then I went through casting. So I still had to go through casting and send a self tape in and all of that. And then luckily I got the role because if it wasn't for the sun coordinator, I probably wouldn't have been submitted for that role. So very fortunate that he put my name up and I got the job. Do you want to talk a bit about that experience of being on that show? Cause that's more or less the hottest thing on television right now. I mean, every time there's a new season, there've only been two, but it just completely takes over all of the internet chatter. And every week, you know, people are, it's almost like game of Thrones all over again where people are going, can you believe what just happened? Like, I can't believe Homelander did that. And I mean, you're now part of one of those. I can't believe Homelander did that situations. Yeah. <laughs> so many memes I've been sent <laughs> and like, even like Instagram pages uh, for my character, even though, you know, I, I was just in the one episode, but no, I'm super fortunate, super lucky to be a part of that show. Like, it's such an awesome show. I typically don't watch a lot of the projects that I'm a part of, but I watch The Boys because it's such a good show. And uh, yeah, I had such a good time. And it's such a uh, shocking scene, especially at the end. I'm not going to say anything. Um, that uh, I think it took a lot of people off guard. A lot of people are like, oh, wow, yeah, this is such a cool character. Like, oh, Chris, that's so awesome. And then they said all the time, they're like, oh, no, <laughs> why they got to do you like that? I was like, well, it serves a purpose. You know, it serves a purpose of the episode and that character to show, again, like you're saying, Homelander, oh, my God, what did he do kind of thing. <laughs> but, yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome to see, like, um, like even the trailer for season two like had the uh I can i doesn't matter if i say what happens right i had to like attack yeah, everybody saw it like i mean if you haven't watched the boys by now it's not our fault that you're missing out on the best thing on television so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but yeah i had him like clapping me in the ears and the screen i was like oh <laughs> yeah yeah pretty cool but hopefully Anthony Starr is not a total nightmare to work with. <laughs> no, he's he's awesome. He's a really nice guy. And uh, he's such a good actor because <laughs> he turns it on like so well and so quickly. Um, but like, you know, in between that, he's just really cool, really nice guy. So. Mm -hmm. Did you feel sort of um, 
maybe like you're relating to the material of that scene because they're the show is exposing a lot to do with the corporatization of superheroes, which in their world is because superheroes are real, but that's very applicable to the superhero saturation of the entertainment market. And more specifically diversity quotas, because now Hollywood is becoming more inclusive, but then it's always that question of, are they doing it for the right reasons and are they approaching it the right way? Which you can kind of see in that scene, they're not really doing it with the most noble intentions. It's more like, Oh no, it'll give us good PR and we'll get points or what. I don't know what points. Yeah. I mean, I'm not in the corporate world, but yeah. Yeah. They're definitely poking, poking fun at that kind of what's going on in Hollywood right now, which is cool. Like I, I like the boys. Cause it's just like, there's so many superhero shows out there. It's like, these are the heroes. They're so great. They're going to save the world. And then the boys is like the complete opposite where the heroes are like the bad guys. Right. But so I, it, it's a really interesting take. Um, but yeah, it's true. Even in that, in that episode, they say all we need now is a female to balance it out. Cause they're trying to hit all the different, you know, points, marketing points and things like that. But yeah, that, that's definitely, a, <laughs> I don't know how I feel about it because like, it's a real issue, but at mm-hmm. the same time it's like, okay, cool. They brought in an ethnic, you know, disabled uh superhero but then and then they just like destroy him (laughs) (laughs) yeah and then the next episode the other um i doubled kenji as well who's the the brother of uh the female and then they they just kill him too and i was like ah let asian men (laughs) live a little longer Mm. have a you know bigger role but it's getting there for sure um, and a friend of mine, Simu Lu, he's doing big things. He's going to be the first like Asian male superhero. So that's a big step in the right direction. Um, yeah. It's really interesting how Hollywood is, is changing, right? How everything's kind of adapting to, to this new, diverse modern age. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was just going to say like, oh, it's so nice of Marvel to be inclusive after 20, 30 films or however many it's been in their cinematic universe. But let me not be shady on this interview and like risk you maybe booking a job with them. So we don't have to get into all of that. But uh, I did want to ask how you feel the climate is evolving. And because obviously you've been working in the industry before this sort of Asian renaissance, I guess you could say, started happening with like crazy rich Asians and the farewell and parasite where they're becoming uh, commercial hits and award show hits and all that. So like if you're feeling better about how things are for you and your opportunities, or if you feel like the authenticity can be more of an issue, then maybe it's being addressed kind of like how it was uh, talked about in the boys. Mm -hmm. I I definitely like think and know there's more opportunities um, for Asians. And it just goes back from like when I first started working stunts. Um, I never doubled. Like I rarely, rarely, rarely stunt doubled actors because there wasn't a lot of Asian male actors uh, back like 10, 15 years ago in, in, in like every movie or every TV show. Right. But now because of Hollywood uh, being inclusive and like, even having certain quotas of like, you have to have like so many ethnicities. Um, there's more jobs. Like I get more calls for doubling. I find that Asian women are definitely like take a big step forward. And I think Asian men um, are kind of like coming up next, but definitely, definitely more opportunities. I still see a lot of breakdowns. Like when I go and audition for acting roles that like, you know, it's, so, not all the time, but like a lot of times it's like he does martial arts or, you know, something that's kind of Asian specific. Um, I think just in time, yeah, it's going to, it's going to keep going. And I like where I am right now um, as an actor and like the opportunities that could potentially be in front of me. So I'm just going to work hard at my craft, you know, to be the best actor I can be. I don't want to get a job because I'm the right ethnicity. If that makes mm. sense. I get a job because I'm the right um actor for the job. So I'll always have that mentality um, going in, develop myself as an artist. And as long as I feel like I'm growing as an artist, as an actor, I'm happy. When you talk about doubling actors, that is a pretty decent way to segue into talking about Scott Pilgrim, because we started to talk about it last time before all the technical malfunctions crashed the interview. But you've got a terrifying photo on your Instagram that I would pull up if I had saved of you Mm -hmm 
with a Michael Sarah <laughs> prosthetic on your face to put his face on your face. So do you want to talk a bit about getting that job and the many, many stunts you did on that film, not just for him, but for a whole multitude of characters? Yeah, that was that was like that was my longest job that I've ever worked on. It was seven months long. And that's because four months, three to four months were just prep, like all rehearsals, training actors and creating action. And it all started. I did a test shoot. So they wanted to do a test shoot of this scene to try to work on the style with the effects and everything. And I played Matthew Patel and my friend Ruben Langdon played uh, Scott Pilgrim. Um, and we did a fight scene and this and that. And then when they started filming, they brought me on the team to double the same character. But then as we were going, we couldn't find someone thin enough to double Michael Sarah that also had that martial art background that they were looking for. So for some reason, they're like, oh, Chris is pretty skinny. <laughs> and then they're like, what if we, hmm, but he's Chinese, <laughs> he's, Asian, he's half Asian. So like, what if we make a mask of, and put a, you know, a prosthetic Michael Sarah mask on his face? So they did this test. They put this mask on. Totally creepy, like, but such a good job. Like it was, it was so spot on. And they brought me out for like a show and tell. And we did some tests and they're like, yep, that'll work. So then that's how it happened. And then I doubled him and I also doubled um, <laughs> Ramona a little bit on it. Um, and I doubled like some of the other characters, like a day here, a day there. So it was a big job. I was very like, like a very utility stunt double. And they Is that what that means? Utility stunts? Does that just mean we just throw you wherever we need you? Or Yeah, kinda, yeah that's usually what it means. <laughs> it's like a utility baseball player. Like they can play any position. So they just like put them around. Okay, I don't know sports, but you you explained it well enough that I understand what you're saying. So that's good. Um, you were also on Jumper as Jamie Bell's stunt person, which was a delight for me to learn because it gave me an excuse to go back and rewatch that film for the first time in probably over a decade. So I think you had said before when we tried to do this interview last time that you it was your first big job or your first big feature or something like that. Was that correct? Yeah, that was yeah, that was my first first big feature, and uh, I was I think it was like nineteen or twenty, and my brother was like the lead double on it, the main double for Jamie Bell, and then they needed a second double because he teleports all the time, so they wanted to use two people in the scene, and just like like he's teleporting kind of thing, so that was a that was that was a really fun job um, because it was such a big movie and. As the second double, there wasn't that much to do, but you're still there every day. And uh, yeah, I was having a blast. I was in university at the time. And I remember I was like, just started the first term. I think I was in second year, third year, maybe third year. And uh, I got this job. So I'm like, okay, I'll miss a week of class. Cool. And then the next, and then after the week's done, they're like, oh, you're back next week. And I'm like, okay. Okay, I can I can miss two weeks of school, no problem. Then that week ended like, oh, we need you next week as well. And I'm like, shoot. Because there's like a cutoff line that if you don't drop your courses, it will affect your 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 marks. Yeah. So I just had to make a decision. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna miss three weeks. You know, I might not work on this jumper job anymore. Um, but should I just give up? I could just like drop all my courses. But then if I don't work on the jumper job, then like I have nothing to do essentially. So I just decided, okay, I'm going to drop all my courses. So I dropped all my courses and then I ended up working on that show for like three months. So it was like perfect, but that was the start of like, okay, I'm going to finish school, but this is the career I want to do. So you did finish school. I did. I went back. I did some, I did courses. Uh, I wanted to get my, my degree. So I think it's important. I, at the time I thought it is important. It is important. But yeah, definitely at the time it's like, you know, film, you're like, uh, I don't know how it's going to work out. Like I need a backup plan kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I kind of noticed that when you get into the background and trivia of a lot of the more successful Asians in Hollywood, a lot of them did get their degrees and like, it doesn't really matter what their degrees were in, but all of them went to school and like, mm -hmm went through it. And I do kind of feel like part of that is probably just the cultural thing of your parents nagged you of the importance of education and you go, all right, okay, I'll get the degree. And then 
Yeah. I don't really know how I feel about it because on the one hand, degrees can be important and the process of getting a degree can teach you a lot of skills, you know, about like, I don't know, time management, getting things done. But also it puts you at a disadvantage because you're competing against people who have been trying to get acting or Hollywood jobs for much longer than you. So they have longer resumes and they have more contacts. And also they're just white usually. (laughs) Yeah, it's always, I mean, it's always a trade-off. Like I imagine like what if instead of doing four years of business, um, what if I did four years of theater school, right? I'd probably, I'd be definitely be a different person today Mm -hmm. at the same time like it's it's a it's a it's more secure to do the four years of business because i can kind of fall back on it as well as you know i can use i have a martial arts school as well so i I definitely put it into application Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah always always a trade-off and i find that's always a trade-off with like working like if i work stunts versus if i'm in class uh, acting right or if i'm working versus auditioning it's like you can't do everything you really can't like you can't, I want to be good at everything, right? Like hundred percent my stunt um, and like my, my stunt skill set definitely, you know, it, it was kind of like going like this, but now it's just kind of like this, right? Like I'm putting less, I have to put less time into that and more time into acting or else I'm not going to get to where I want to be. And I realize that, I realize that like, I'm not, you know, growing in one thing as much as I was, but I'm growing in another thing. So it, it's, it's always a trade-off. You can't, you can't do everything. You can't be like extremely good at everything as well, but you can definitely maintain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Efficiency, zero waste efficiency program. That's, that's my motto this year. <laughs> it's a good motto. Good mm-hmm. motto to have. So I did want to ask, I think I tried to ask this before, before everything just went array. How do you learn outside of the more formal martial arts training when it comes to doing stunts? How do you learn the things that don't really exist in martial arts and only really exist to do with stunts, like crashing through walls and falling Mm -hmm. without, but you're not really falling. Like, so you're not actually getting hurt, you know, whether it's breaking into furniture or uh, falling downstairs. I don't know if you've ever had to do that, but um, you you need to explain it. Because I like I watch them like how are you falling downstairs and not dying? Mm-hmm. That's the whole thing. <laughs> I would say like it's kind of you like for me it definitely was you know you learn as you go which is kind of messed up. But these days there's definitely like classes you can take if you want to work on like fight choreography like you want to work on reactions like how to sell a punch or if you want to work work on falls like how to fall properly and things like that. Um, but when I started, there weren't, I didn't take any courses. I take, I didn't take any courses. I just like learned from people and I just like went as I, as I, as I did it, like I did the mummy and I remember I had to do a stair fall on that. And they're like, yeah, fall, you're going to get shot here and fall down the stairs. And I'm like, okay. And then I just did it. I just fell down the stairs. (laughs) I have pretty good body control. So anyone that has like good body control or maybe even the acrobatics, like, you know, where you are when you're rolling. The main thing is you just protect your head. So you roll sideways, you keep your arms up, you pad up, and then you just kind of go for it. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it doesn't. Hmm. So with you transitioning more into acting or aiming to transition more into acting, do you (laughs) feel like you're interested in still pursuing jobs that have that hybridization of a more physical element to those characters? You know, you have projects nowadays like John Wick and you have those big idol figures uh not just bruce lee because that's the obvious choice especially because we're asians and we're talking about asian representation but you know there's those big a-list movie stars that you know a lot of their most memorable jobs have a lot of action in them so is that something you're interested in pursuing or yeah that's like my ideal kind of job is if i can do you know my own acting and my own action at the same time so we did a movie called Kill Order back in 2009. And that was like the first time I could be like the lead of the film as well as do all my own fight scenes. And it was a really cool experience. It was awesome. And so since then, we did another movie called Enhance. And yeah, that's my goal. I'm, I'm working towards that. So stunt actor roles are great too, like Blind Spot. Um, and though I'm doing one right now on Man from Toronto. Um, they're always great just for the experience and just for the credit and the exposure, but definitely like, I'd like 
something with a little more substance, like character wise, like whether it being like one of the leads in the film or something like that, but having the action drive the story, which I find is uh, most interesting to me. Mm. Do you want to talk about working with your brother? Sure. The film you did. Yeah. It was good. Yeah. My brother's a, he used to be a stunt performer as well. And he transitioned more to director producer. Um, so we've worked together on a couple of films now and, you know, people ask like, is it hard working with your brother? And you think it would be, and I thought it would be, but it wasn't, it was pretty smooth because we both know our roles. Like his job is this, my job is this, like I'm coming in as an actor, as a performer, as a choreographer, and he's the director, so it's his vision, and I'll give suggestions and things like that. But overall, I was just happy to have the opportunity to work with him. We've been working together since, like, live stage performance days through ups and downs. Um, so it's pretty natural uh, transition to work, to work together in film as well. So another job you did, which is funny that we started off this interview talking about the boys, was the Hunger Games. Oh, my. First one. With Jack Quaid, I was actually wearing a Hunger Games shirt earlier before I I got changed for this because it was a freebie that they were giving out at Comic-Con back when you were allowed to go to Comic-Con in person because the world had not fallen apart yet. Um, Well, maybe a little, just not all the way. So uh, do you want to talk a bit about that experience and, you know, because you were the one of the tributes and then also, I guess, a stunt performer. I think it was another double, double billing for you. Yeah, so I had auditioned to be uh, a tribute in the games, um, District 5 Tribute Boy. I was in L.A. at the time, and um, I was working in L.A. It's like my first time working in L.A., and it was really great and awesome. And then, yeah, someone's like, oh, we're looking for people that look like, you know, 17, 16, uh, that can act. It's like, can you audition for this role? So I'm like, okay, cool. And I auditioned, and it's like, what's it for? It's like the Hunger Games. I was like, oh, cool. I was like, what's that? <laughs> never heard of the hunger games i'm like uh no <laughs> like it's like so big it's huge i'm like okay sweet so i auditioned and i got one of the parts so then we filmed that in north carolina and uh it was a lot of fun like i look quite young for my age i know maybe not now because i got facial hair but uh if i shave this i'd look like a baby so i was definitely one of the older people in the group in the cast um, and they were all like kids. So it was pretty much felt like a high school summer camp with like me, who was like 20. Uh, I don't want to age myself right now. But I was in my twenties. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of fun. And it's interesting because that's when I first met Jack and then he came to do the boys. And then when I saw him and went on the boys, like even in the first season, I was like, Jack, and he's like, Oh my God, what are you doing here? And I'm like, I'm from Toronto. He's like, oh, yeah, that's right. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So it was cool. And then Woody Harrelson's in Man from Toronto, but I guarantee he probably doesn't remember me. So I just, I didn't, I didn't do that with Woody. Go, Yo, Woody, <laughs> what's up? Remember me from Hunger Games? I literally had like no scenes with him. So yeah, it's probably just you remembering, like, oh my God, that's Woody Harrelson. Yeah, so. but that movie was crazy. Like, I didn't know. Like, as soon as they put something online, like, oh, Chris Markin is a tribute boy, like, my Instagram and my Twitter just was like, pop, 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 like, followers, 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 followers. And I was like, what is going on? Like, I was shocked. And uh, that's how I got a lot of my followers is, is from the Hunger Games, surprisingly. Um, and then I get all these messages, like, Cause they, you know, they want to know like the story and, and all the details and things like that. But <laughs> you got to keep super hush hush. I used to get mail. I used to get like mail of like, can you please sign this and send it back? And it'd be like pictures and things like this. And this was like totally new for me. And I thought, wow, I'm only like district five tribute boy. And like the obsession, the fan obsession with the movie is like insane. It's interesting that you mentioned Jack, because I don't know if you saw this or not, but someone on Twitter after your episode of The Boys aired had tweeted him and said, is no one going to talk about the fact that Chris Mark and Jack Quaid are having a Hunger Games reunion? And Jack actually quote tweeted it onto his page and was said, I'm so glad you pointed it out. I'm so excited or something like that. It was super cute. Yeah, I'm shocked that <laughs> they, they put those two like two and two together. So quickly, right? Or whoever, whoever did it. But yeah, that was funny too. Yeah, definitely. Is he as nice as he seems? He's so nice. 
He's like the nicest, nicest. He's as nice as he seems as his character. Nicer, probably. Yeah, he's a really nice guy. Really cool. Down to earth. Hard worker. Really talented. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good since, I mean... You know, I think I, I'm one of those people that tends to get into a rant about like, oh, the nepotism of Hollywood. And like, he would fall into that. But he's actually really good at acting. And he seems like a really nice person. I'm like, all right, you can stay. The rest of you nepotism babies, you can leave. Yeah, he gets he gets a pass, right? Yeah. <laughs> but no one else, right? Everyone else. <laughs> I mean, there's too many of them. Yeah. They're over. Uh, there's people where I don't even realize there's nepotism, and then I Google them, and then it's like, oh, that's who their parents are. <sighs> of course, of course. Mm -hmm. Or uh, even if their parents aren't in the industry, though, sometimes it's like, oh, they come from money, and I'm going, of course, it's always something. Uh, I did want to ask you. On your IMDb, it said that you did stunts for Suicide Squad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> To be clear for everyone, since now there's a sequel, the first Suicide Squad, the one with David Ayer, so just so there's no confusion, can you say what, what stunts you were doing? Because yeah. I did not I, realize that was I, on your credits. I was, uh, I was one, of the, one of many of the, the demons, so they're called EAs, and they, um, those guys in the black suits that like... They're in every scene. They just get like shot and killed in every scene. So that was a pure um, stunt performer role that I did, and that was that was interesting. That was that was pretty tough work, I would say. You know, very demanding physically. We had to do like these crazy parkour runs over cars on wires, like all night. Um, but it was also really fun too, because everyone on the like all the cast were really cool. Like, I remember Will Smith gave me a fist bump, like, when we were about to shoot the scene. I was just like, <gasps> I get so starstruck, like, still, like, even though, like, I've been on set for so long. If I see somebody that's, like, maybe I'm a fan of or I like, I'm just like, <gasps> but that was actually also the first time I met Karen uh, Fukuhara, who's the female in The Boys. And uh, we became friends after that. And then she was back, and then she came back to Toronto on The Boys. So she has, like, a lot of experience in toronto it seems like she's always here but uh, she's really she's really good she's really cool too and she's really talented uh martial arts as well she does a lot of you know, her own stuff on the boys wait she knows martial arts mm -hmm. oh i didn't know that i should have stalked her better i love her but like yeah. clearly I'm, I'm not up to date on my trivia then yeah. she did some martial arts and then she had to do like a lot of sword work in suicide squad and then she has to do a bunch of stuff always in the boys yeah she's very Physically talented. She's good. Yeah, she posted that video of her doing the like, what is it? You like, you get on top of a person and you like strangle them with your legs. And I was just going, I love her. Actual superhero, Karen Fukuhara. I love her. Like yeah. my new favorite person. But she's been my favorite person for years now. I'm so embarrassing. Like anytime I'm at a press conference and she's there, I'm like, I'm just, I have a question for Karen. I don't <laughs> care about anybody else. Mm hmm. So um, when you are uh, looking at jobs, do you get to be choosy at all? Or is it pretty much just take whatever I can get? Because I know that once you start to get more um, offers, then mm -hmm. potentially you have the option to say no to things. And mm -hmm. like, I would be interested in knowing what would make you say yes or no to certain jobs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I think it depends on the individual and what their goals are. But definitely when you start out, if you're just doing stunts, it's like you take every job. Like you, you cancel, change any plans or work that you have to do the job because you just want to work with that stunt coordinator and like have another connection. Um, but as you get older, you're like, yeah, like I'm definitely a lot more, I guess, choosier with my jobs. Um, I have a clear goal of like what I want to do. Um, so if I feel like a job is not, you know, going to help me get there, then yeah, I might, I might say no. I've definitely said, passed on a lot of jobs in the last few years um, and just kind of been a little more selective because like I was saying before, it's like your time is so limited and stunts can be so lucrative and it can be 
a bit of a handcuff. Um, and I come from a different perspective, I think, than like a, like a regular stunt, just a stunt performer, because I do have this like inclination to want to get into acting more and do acting. And like, I'll sack, I, I'm willing to sacrifice like jobs and even like financial stuff to free up that time to pursue the acting side of it. So definitely, um, I still perform as a stunt performer, but anything that kind of doesn't help long-term uh, for my acting career, then I might, you know, pass. But I don't like to say that because it sounds like I'm like <laughs> really picky with things, which I'm, I'm not that picky. Like, I, I'm not getting like millions of stunt job offers or anything, but mm. definitely priorities have changed, right? Mm-hmm. Being that you have your degree in business, how have you used that, if all, in building your career and building up yourself as, I guess, a public figure? I don't know if you have that uh, mentality, because obviously we're now in an age of uh, influencer culture and a lot of people can kind of grow their own followings. And if you have a certain size following, then you can potentially leverage that to do things or meet people or whatnot. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, it's such a good point because that's, that's a pivot I'm still kind of, you know, struggling with because I, I know where the industry is leading. You know, it's like, if you have a lot of Instagram followers, you know, you could potentially have easier job getting some jobs because they know they have a guaranteed market that's going to s- watch you in that film or that you can promote to on your Instagram. Um, but I, I use Instagram, but I don't use it in the way to just get followers. If that makes sense. Like I don't post that often, but I do know there's a bit of a, like a strategy and a game to it, right. In order to build a following and to, and to market yourself better. So I'm definitely like opening my mind up to that more. Maybe I'm a little more old school, but, um, do do you know what, but do you know what I mean by that in terms of like, there's like a formula, I guess you could say of like when, how often you're supposed to post, you know, tagging and this and that and this and that. And I'm still pivoting towards like doing that more. Um, mm-hmm. But I do think it's, and I, and I know it's super important, right. In the future, it's just about doing it. The only thing is like, I'll see some people that like, they do it so much and like, they, uh, I want to say like, <laughs> I don't want to say like fake it till you make it, but like they don't, they don't have, they don't, it's, it's not real. Like they don't really have the credits or this or that, but they have like so many followers because they know how to like big things up or like get publicity on themselves, even mm-hmm. though there's nothing to get publicity on. I don't know if that makes sense, but you see these people, they have like hundreds of thousands of followers and it's like, wait, how did they do that? And then like, they kind of maybe use something they had a small role in and they make it look like it's a a huge thing. Right. And then people are like, Oh my God. So that's definitely something I never want to like do. So that's Mm -hmm. why I'm like kind of struggling and slowly pivoting to how, you know, to build a following. Yeah. The right way. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, I've seen stuff online about how apparently they're selling, um, the, the, the things that they do to film uh, interior things for jets, like private jets, they'll now sell those where you can rent out for an hour to just go take pictures and pretend like you're flying somewhere, like you're super fancy. Mm-hmm. And that's just so funny to me. Of all the things to spend your money on, let's mm-hmm. go rent out a thing so I can pretend I'm on a plane going somewhere, which you shouldn't even... You shouldn't even pretend to be doing that right now because of a pandemic, but I guess this was already happening before the pandemic. So, yeah, I I believe it. (laughs) I've seen some, we've all seen things on Instagram where we're like, what? (laughs) Is this real? I mean, I just, uh, the only time I go on Instagram, it's to follow animal rescue accounts. So I don't think I'm Instagramming the way other people are Instagramming. I don't care about models. That's just going to give me a, body dysmorphia or something crazy like that. Um, but I did want to ask, uh, cause I think I read in one of your interviews, something about how you were interested in action where it's merging gun action with fight choreography. So 
if that is accurate and I read that correctly, if you wanted to elaborate a bit on that and also maybe how you feel about guns being in action films. Cause like, I know you're Canadian, so it's like a different thing up there, but especially if it's a Hollywood situation, I mean, there's always a, a discussion around the depiction of guns in media and uh, whether it should happen or whatever. I'm not trying to get you in trouble. It's just like, you can give oh. whatever opinion you have on that. Yeah. I mean, I like gunplay. I love it. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I, maybe that might be a bit of a misconception. I know like the, obviously the gun, the gun rules are a little stricter up here. Um, but I'm down for guns and choreography. Like I love, if I'm on set and I'm like a SWAT guy or a cop and I get to shoot some blanks off, like that's so much fun. Like I love doing that. So I'd love to do more roles where I could do that. And that's actually um, something I find really interesting to train is like the military stuff and like how they like turn corners and how they reload and things like that. I find that really cool. Um, In terms of mix with like fight choreography, I think, I think like John Wick does a really good job of that. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people try to imitate that, but mostly not, not successfully. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd love to do stuff like that in a film, but I'd love to learn from those guys specifically as opposed to try to do it, do it ourselves. You know, mm-hmm. I'm always big on like, you go to the people that are the best, the experts, right. As opposed to trying to recreate, you know, if you can, so you always got to get like firsthand. I think it's called firsthand. Firsthand learning is always mm-hmm. the best way if you want to like, ingrain it into yourself the proper way and then once you know how it's explained the techniques and the breakdown of it then you know it's easier to perform as opposed to if you just watch a video and you go oh they're just moving their arm here okay so move your arm here and then we'll turn it here like you don't know um you know the the dynamics of the movement specifically which which makes a big difference yeah where i don't know where that interview is from though i wonder if i was doing something at the time with guns and hand fight. I don't even remember because I did a lot of this research. What was it? A couple weeks ago <laughs> when we tried to do the first interview. So I don't have all the citations fresh in my mind. And I also didn't know you were going to quiz me on where I found my, where I found my info. Yeah, no, it was just me like going through your IMDB page, trying to look for video interviews. There weren't really a lot of those. And then uh, print interviews, Instagram. I think that was about it. And also, I just, like I already follow Jack on Twitter, so that's why I knew about that tweet because I saw it on my feed. It was okay. just him being excited, like, "Yeah, me and Chris, Hunger Games reunion." <laughs> so, mm. so do you? You also work on Titans, right? Do you still work on Titans, or you did work on Titans? I did. I haven't. I haven't this year. It's been so busy. Um, but I'll probably, I'll probably pop by the Titans. What was it called Titan's Mansion or Titan's Tower? I'll probably pop by the Titan's Tower next year. Say what's up to my friend Ryan, who's Beast Boy, who's awesome, Ryan Potter, um, who I double uh, from time to time. And then a lot of my friends and the guys on our performance team, Team 2X, they are all working on Titans. So um, the lead double for Nightwing Robin is uh, Mustafa, who's a guy on our team. And then we have a bunch of other guys over there that are doubling people as well. So they're having a blast. I, that. <laughs> I would hope so. Yeah. So many Instagram stories, those guys just working out, getting jacked, being superheroes. So it's, it's a dream. It's a dream for them. Were you just a stunt performer or did you also do um, fight choreography? Yeah, I did uh, the first season. I did a few episodes. I did the first four episodes uh, as a fight coordinator. So that was cool. Got to create some Robin-style fighting. And uh, yeah. Do you have a particular sequence that you choreographed that you're especially proud of from that show? Um, I choreographed the Chinatown sequence. So it's when like the three like Robin... Hawk and Dove are fighting a bunch of Asians from Chinatown. <laughs> so it was fun. Like we did it at night in Chinatown uh, in the cold, but uh, it turned out pretty good. And uh, I had my brother in that scene and I, I like beat him up all night. I told him like, Oh, come, uh, come play one of the, the, the cooks with like, 
the knives or whatever, right? And he's like, is it easy? I'm like, yeah, yeah, it should be fine. But then, like, we ended up, like, throwing him into, like, buckets of, like, you know those styrofoam, like, squid containers? Yeah, so, like, we kept throwing him into that. And, like, we threw a squid on his face and things like that. <laughs> so he wasn't, ha- he wasn't too impressed because, you know, he thought it was going to be easy, but it was a little difficult. But, yeah, that was lots of fun. Were you tricking him or did you just genuinely not know you were going to do that until you no. shut up and you're like, you know what? I have an idea. Yeah. You just don't know. They just keep changing. They change things all the time. And then like, Oh, now you're this guy. Oh, whoops. That's, that's the guy that gets thrown onto the ground. Like <laughs> does a side flip onto his back. I'm like, well, you can do it. So may as well. Yeah. So you've said uh, multiple times that, you're interested in transitioning into acting, but do you have any other aspirations in the filmmaking world as far as writing or directing or things of that nature? I mean, again, there's only so many hours, so it's, you can't always do all the jobs, but uh, mm-hmm. just in a general sense, is that something that interests you? Which, which directing? Writing or directing. Direct, directing definitely interests me. Um, I think for myself right now, uh, because I'm young, I just want to devote like as much time into performing as I can um, while still learning about directing and other things. Um, But yeah, definitely something I would be interested in the future. I've done some second unit, like I've done some action directing before and that's a lot of fun. Um, But yeah, who knows, who knows what the future will hold, but I think it's really important to to be diverse, right? Like not like be able to wear a bunch of different hats. Um, because when in the film industry, opportunities come so quick and very unexpected sometimes. So the more prepared you are, like as prepared as you can be, um, the more opportunity there is to jump into these different fields, even in stunts, whether, you know, whether it be, you know, stunt coordinating, fight coordinating, um, directing, second year directing. Um, it's skills that I think are important for, for people to have. If they eventually want to get into that, to start developing um, at a young age, at least watching and observing, right? That's, that's, that's a big part of learning. Mm. So you mentioned, it's just a small thing you said, but you're saying, oh, I'm interested in performing while I'm young or like, because I'm young, do you feel like ageism is an issue for men in the industry too? Cause I know ageism is a huge problem for women in the industry, but are you feeling that pressure at all? Or like, do you feel the ticking clock? Mm, or no. am I reading too much into it? <laughs> no, like, no, for sure. There is, there's definitely like a window, right? Um, I don't feel like it's closing anytime soon, but you know, you definitely want to be as time efficient as you can. In terms of acting, like the window is like, you know, extremely large, right? If you're just acting. But, you know, my goal is to be not just an actor, but an action actor. Mm. So I want to do as many cool projects and cool action as I can while I am young. Because as you get older, like even the best in the world, as they get older, like you slow down, your body slows down naturally, right? Uh, it's only um, so hard you can go. Right. And then you get a stunt double to do some of the hard things that you don't want to do. Mm. But I'd like to, yeah, keep pushing the envelope as much as I can and, uh, and take advantage of, of youth. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Physical fitness and all that. Not me saying that while I'm like in terrible shape, like embarrassingly bad shape, but that's besides the point. Um, with you, you know, working your way up, do you have any dream jobs as far as film franchises or uh, maybe certain directors you'd like to work with? Maybe Chad Stahelski is the obvious name to drop, but like just anyone really that sticks out. I want to be a Jedi (laughs) with a lightsaber. I want to do like a star Wars fight Jedi character. That would be really cool. And I also like, really like kind of like, Matthew Bourne style characters. That's like, like I was saying before, it's like martial arts with like um, gun action and just like military kind of like close combat stuff. Um, 
yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty open for pretty much anything acting related mm. <laughs> within like my guidelines. But I, I think, I think I'm a huge anif- anime fan. A huge, huge anime fan. So anything live action kind of anime style that can be done properly. Like I'm not talking Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball, whatever that Dragon Ball Z movie was. I don't know if you saw it in live action. But like that can be done well. Like Kenshin. Have you seen Kenshin? The Japanese. Okay. Kenshin is a Japanese anime series and they made like Dragon Ball Evolution. There you go. Hussein just wrote in the chat. Yes. Dragon Ball Evolution. I would, I would die inside if I was part of that project, and then and then it turned out like how it did. It was like it, it ruined my Dragon Ball childhood. But Kenshin, which is this Japanese anime that they turned into a live action movie, they did three movies. is is so cool. It's like so well done um, because I find it's really hard to do is like adapt anime into live action. But this is like very well done and 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 awesome. So that kind of job, that's definitely like my dream job. If I could like do a live action anime, but done right. So I probably have to mm-hmm. go to Japan to do it. Well, I was going to ask, cause I've noticed that a fair few Asian actors do at one point or another do jobs in Asia. Sometimes they kind of build up their credits there first and then start doing stuff in Hollywood. So have you done any jobs in any of the Asian industries, like Asian industries in Asia? Yeah, I did a movie in Beijing a long time ago, 2006. It was like before I even got into acting, but acting. Um, And then we worked in Japan a bit in Tokyo. We did a film called Gothic Lolita Psycho uh, with the Ohara brothers. That was a lot of fun. And I think that's it for Asia. But yeah, Mm. definitely open it's it's also very different working in asia like i think we're a little spoiled in north america in terms of film in terms how of, so <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> well hmm. don't be shy we're here to have a chat yes exactly i just make sure i say this right so like in in china like there's certain rules and regulations you know that you have with your union and things like that which are good like they're meant to be there um like locked in place and you know rates i think north america is like one of the higher in terms of being paid as an actor stunt performer uh, in the world so there's that as well so when i was in china like we filmed 21 days straight right like massive 16 hour days sometimes and there's no like penalty with that but in in um north america you can't you can't do that without you know, if you work six days in a row, you get to, you have to be paid time and a half. If you work seven days in a row, you get paid double time. And then if you work like 21 days in a row, you just like double time all the way through. So that's what I mean. But like, I don't want to say spoiled because like I, it, it's there for a reason. Like we shouldn't be working every day. Um, but that might be a preventer of people working uh, in Asia, like especially as a stunt performer, uh, because the rates are lower and the conditions aren't as good. I'll just say that the conditions aren't as good. Mm. Well, I wasn't sure if you had any interest in doing more Asian in Asia type of projects, just in the sense of, because you're talking about wanting to do the kind of action acting and I'm by no means an expert on, you know, try, like Hong Kong action, like all of the the big stuff that they do there. You know, I mean, everybody knows who Jackie Chan is, obviously, and everybody knows who like Jet Li is. But they have their whole their whole scene and their whole style of uh, of that type of content that I don't think is as prominent as uh, as a genre in north american market so i wasn't sure if you had an interest in i don't know like either being influenced by that in creating your own stuff or uh if you wanted to get hired and go do something over there because i i just don't know if the and you can correct me if i'm wrong i'm just speculating but i don't know if the caliber of action acting material is as high on average in hollywood content compared to i think you're I think you're absolutely right. And I would definitely like, if it was like an acting action role, like a good role, I definitely would go over uh, Asian and do it. 
Um, but you're definitely right. There's, there's way, I would say there's more opportunity there because like you said, it's a, there's a whole genre of like martial arts action films and they're all Asian, right? Where yeah. that's not really the case um, in, in North America. Um, so yeah, you, you, you're definitely spot on on that kind of thing. And that's why a lot of people do go there, right? Mm. A lot of people go there and I know a lot of friends that have packed up and went there and tried to, you know, make it as an actor in Asia because one, they can like, they can speak Chinese or wherever they're going, which is useful. And, and two, there's just so many, so much more roles. Right? Mm. Yeah. I think Maggie Q did that where she like went over there and was doing stuff there. And then she came over here and, you know, did Nikita, which is another show that was on your IMDb. Nikita, <laughs> like a lot of the action stars, like they do a film like, like Tony Jaw did this film in Thailand, right? And super popular and like, um, I'm blanking. Ah, the Raid. <laughs> um, same thing, became super popular. And then that's how they transitioned, like Jackie Chan, Jet Li, that's how they, that's how they transitioned into Hollywood. Right. So it's, it's kind of like a formula in a way of, of how, because if you think of like, who are the top Asian action stars, right? You have like Tony Jaa, Donnie Yen, Jackie Chan, uh, Iko, and they all did like an action movie in their country or like were known as like an action star in their country. And then, you know, got a following and, and, and uh, fan base and then Hollywood, you know, would put them in films here and there. Mm. Well, and Keanu Reeves, the one time he directed, I'm pretty sure they did the film all in China. And did you see it? Man of Tai Chi, which I think is super underrated, by the way. I love that. And I need to rewatch that. Mm -hmm. I watched it. Yeah, it's good. Pretty good. I love that he, like, even though he's Keanu Reeves' beloved movie star and just perpetual favorite person to anyone and everyone, and yet when he finally is stepping into the director's chair, he goes, I'm going to make my friend, Tiger Chen, a Chinese stuntman, be the hero, and I'm going to play the bad guy. Yeah, really cool. I love that. I've never met him, but of course a lot of my friends work with him, and I just hear, like, He's the, like, you know, everyone says he's the nicest guy, but like, he is literally like the nicest down to earth guy, apparently. Yeah. It's super nice. When he has a lot of respect for stunt performers, like that was the whole thing, the story came out where I forget which Matrix film it was on, where he bought all of the stunt team, Harley Davidson's. Yeah. Who does that? <laughs> Keanu Reeves. That's who. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that's I, I, with the type of thing that you seem to be interested in doing. I think the dream job would be doing a Matrix film, but it's like how many Matrix films? I mean, I know they're doing another one, but just in a general sense, it's like you don't just every other whatever, every few months have a job to audition for. That's like the Matrix. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? It's such an anomaly in Hollywood mm-hmm. for style and story and all of that. But you should write it. <laughs> write well, a new your own matrix. Are you excited for the new matrix coming out? I'm excited for anything and everything, Keanu Reeves. Are you kidding me? He's got like two more John Wick films he's doing. I don't even know if he's done both of them or one of them so far, but because mm-hmm. of the pandemic. But yeah. Anything and everything Keanu Reeves is is a gift to all of us, you know, and we need it. <laughs> we like Bill and Ted. I love how all his films are getting sequels. Do you yeah. notice that? Like Bill and Ted, Matrix, John Wick, like just, and oh, they're apparently doing a new Constantine. It's a whole thing of just oh, like, really? oh, yeah, where they're I like, Constantine, oh. like such an underrated movie. It's like such a great movie. It really is. Like, yeah. I think, well, and I think that's the whole thing is because his star power, it just kept getting bigger. Like, mm-hmm. it didn't slow down at all. It's only gotten bigger over the years. So it's like they're going back through his filmography, all the studios. They're like, what has he done with us that we can do another one? <laughs> That's also it's crazy in Hollywood. It's just like, they know if they do a reboot of this movie, you know, or a sequel of this movie, like, that's guaranteed to sell. So, like, there's less and less, like, original movies coming out. 
Mm. Because why would they, you know, when they can, hey, let's just remake The Matrix. Yeah, that's going to sell. Everyone's going to watch it. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's also different, though, because it's like it's the same, you know, the people who made it before, they're the ones that are making it now. It's the same actors. It's not just the IP and then you're just turning it into something else. Yeah. I remember they remade something recently and I was like, that movie just came out like 10 years ago. <laughs> but they did like a reboot of it. I can't remember which one. It could yeah. be a n- any number of things because they're just doing it all the time now. It's unreal where I'm like, can you let it sit for a few years longer, please? Like actually let me want it to come back before you're giving me new stuff. Mind you, all the things that I want to see sequels of have not gotten the sequels. I'm yelling on Twitter every day about wanting a man from uncle sequel. Still no man from uncle sequel. How long must I be made to suffer? No idea. But <laughs> you like that movie. Uh, pfft, like that. Like the most understated way I could describe it is to say that I like the man from uncle. Yeah. But that's another, you know, it's fun. Cause there's, there's some action in that as well, but a lot of it comes from the post-production editing to just really, spice it up a bit more and it's very character driven and also it's got a lot of humor and personality which i don't know how much humor gets put into hollywood action films it feels like it's usually very very focused on grit and darkness and oh my my angst ridden traumatic origin story it's like which loved one did i see get murdered and that's my jumping off point as a protagonist but maybe i shouldn't stereotype the genre that you're getting into so sorry (laughs) (laughs) it's okay you have your opinion it's all good they're not all like that but they're kind of i mean even john wick which i love Mm -hmm. what's his origin story it's like oh who got murdered not even just one person it's like oh my wife my wife died Mm -hmm. and then you and then you killed my dog (laughs) it was like Trauma and trauma and trauma. Actually, and I say this as somebody who studied psychology, when you really break down a lot of stories, even if they're very different from each other, it's always to do with trauma. It's always unresolved trauma. It's like, why is this character doing something? Unresolved trauma. It's always unresolved trauma. Like when you really break it down, it's always like, oh yeah, you know, somebody was mean to you when you got your feelings hurt or like you had this thing happen when you were a child or, or, you know, you just had, you lost someone and now you're doing whatever you're doing. So. It's called drama. (laughs) Drama for a reason. Drama. Yeah. I mean, there's only so many reasons to be dramatic. Would you ever, do you have any experience doing comedy? Do you want to do comedy? Can you do action comedy? I'd love to. I don't know if I have. I haven't done that much experience in comedy. Um, I've done improv for quite a bit, quite a while now. So I love comedy. And uh, our team's done a lot of different comedy skits for um, a reality show we did. And it was always the most fun doing the comedy because, like, I find you can be, like, a lot more creative because Mm. it be as, like, serious and everything doesn't have to make sense. But we were thinking about doing this project, but we're going to do it just a matter of when. Um, it's a comedy. It's about a kid who's like bullied and he, uh, (laughs) he like his idols, like an old school martial arts superhero that died in like this, uh, fatal drinking and driving car accident. So like the actors, like, it's kind of like Johnny Cage. He's like a, he's like a Hollywood star, but he's like, you know, he has his vices. Um, and anyways, he comes back in like a ghost form and like teaches him martial arts and like how to like defend himself and grow as a person. So mm. it's like pure comedy. It's like super excited to do it because we've just been doing like dramatic and like sci-fi and like, which is cool. Like I love it, but like, it's nice to switch it up. Mm. Yeah. Well, and I'm sure the the tone becomes very different and you, you and like what you're putting your body through, not just because of the stunts, but just the burden, not burden is the wrong word, but you know, the wear and tear of playing a character is probably very different if it's a more comedic project than some really dark, dramatic, angst ridden, you know, mm-hmm. typical action fodder, what have you. Like if, like if you were doing something like Charlie's Angels, the good ones from the 2000s with 
all my girls and McG directing and all that, where it's very humorous and it's very light, but the action is still like 10 out of 10. You know, those girls worked their butts off training for, oh my God, what was their schedule? Like eight or nine hours a day. They train for months with uh, experts from Hong Kong, I think. And yeah, it was, it was no joke. They did a lot of those stunts themselves. So I guess, I guess you just have to go hunting really. You just have to have your feelers out and be like, okay, what are, who, what's being made right now? And how do I get in it? Mm-hmm. It's funny though, because like comedy is usually like, maybe like, yeah, like a character, it's not as, it's more lighter, but like physically, it's usually harder. Really? Yeah. Because like this, like the film I'm working on right now, it's a comedy. Um, and I was like, oh yeah, but the, that's good. The stunts probably will be like not, not as intense. And then the, somebody's like, are you crazy? It's a comedy. They want to make it even look more wild and crazy. I'm like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> when I think about it, like, oh yeah, that does make sense. Mm. So like they want to see like if a guy has to get like, you know, thrown or like, you know, hit, hit with a rocket launcher or whatever. Like he's going to, he's not just going to go back. He's going to go back and like flip around in the air and it's going to look like, you know, comedic, which mm. is probably harder. So. So is it very different than the types of, stunts you have to do or the the action i guess with it being comedic um yeah i'd I'd say so yeah a little bit definitely there's Mm. definitely some similarities but um yeah definitely definitely a little different from what i've seen on the show yeah for sure so i know that when you're working on something and still filming you can't give specifics on it but being that we're in the whole brave new world of it's a pandemic and you have to figure out how to still do filmmaking how is it being on set and uh, what do you have to do now as an actor or just as a person like what are the regulations sorry if that's a boring question but i think the fans of content are usually kind of interested in so like how how does how do things happen now? How is everything running? You know, the fact that you're able to still carry on like COVID wise. Yeah. Yeah. So it's completely different. Um, I mean, something similar, but like, it's a big change. Um, like starting off, like you have to, it depends on the production. Like every production is different. Um, but usually like you're testing every other day. Um, if you're on set, like if you're on camera, you're going to be around actors. You'll do like a rapid test, which will give you like results, like within 10 minutes. Um, you're always wearing a mask all the time, no matter what, if you're outside, if you're indoors, if you're alone (laughs) or not, if you're alone, if you're like, if people's like 20 feet away from you, you gotta wear a mask until, uh, you film, then obviously you can, you take the mask off and then everything's just like, you know, like what used to be like a, yeah, this is, this, this answer is definitely a little boring for me, but what, what used to be like a buffet for like lunch is like, everything's individually packaged. Um, everyone's wait. If you're, if you're not on camera, everyone's wearing masks and face shields. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely different, but when you start filming, filming's usually the same. Cause you know, you don't have any extra mm-hmm. precautions. So uh, is it more work for the makeup people now that they constantly have to retouch everyone's face because they've been wearing masks the whole time? Yep. Definitely. Probably. Or like even the, their hair, hair and makeup. Oh my God. I didn't even think about that until you said that, but then you're mentioning, Oh yeah. Well, everyone always has to wear a mask. And then I'm going, wait a minute. And they, they have a, people. a COVID department that will just go around, uh, guys, six feet. Um, can you put your mask over your nose? Or they'd be like, Oh, that mask is not recognized. Here's a new one. <laughs> <laughs> so basically they have a whole department of babysitters now. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> like you know, just like yeah so that's their job right so i think for films because we're lucky to have films still shooting right now in productions but i think in, for insurance purposes they have to have those people you know they have mm. to do due diligence and be extra extra safe and extra cautious so it's fine just do you do- feel like the industry is now at least for a while going to maybe design more of their stories around like, Oh, we don't have to have people in the same place at the same time in close proximity. Or do you think they're not thinking 
that like in that much detail? I think definitely right now they would be like, if they have like, Oh, we have this huge crowd scene, da da da. they're definitely going to look at that and be like, okay, how can we make it less people or what can we do to not do a huge crowd scene? Mm. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think? Do you think like if there's like intimate moments with like between actors or like things like that, they're going to be like, well, maybe we don't do it because, or that would take away from the story, right? If it was like an important part of the story. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. I'm not in those discussions. Well, cause I think, I mean, it's my understanding anyway, I've never made a movie myself, but uh, a lot of these things, they take so long to make that a lot of what's being made right now was stuff that was already put into motion long before the pandemic actually happened. But apparently Michael Bay put together like a pandemic film already and it's like got a movie poster and everything. And I'm like, uh, what timeline am I living in? How is this a thing already? Did you shoot this already? Like, do you have that much free time, Michael Bay? Don't you just have like your mansion already that you can just be quiet and leave us alone and not subject us to more pandemic content. But yeah, yeah. I don't know if that really answers what you were asking me, like what I think, but it's just more like, Oh my God, Michael Bay is making a pandemic film. That's super weird. That is weird. (laughs) So fast. How how did he do that already? I didn't know that. There's going to be a lot of docs too. Like lots. It's going to be documentary city, COVID documentary city, you know, it's it's probably easier to make. Yeah. And not have to put people together. <laughs> yeah. So what is a pandemic movie? Like it's not based on this pandemic. It's just based on a pandemic kind of like playing on the theme of this pandemic. I think so. But I'm just like, Michael Bay, please leave us alone. <laughs> oh, I should clip that and turn it into like a meme or something. And let me not become his enemy. I'm not even trying to come for him like that. I'm just making jokes, but I shouldn't do that since I don't even know if he has a sense of humor. Um, so is there anything that you would like to promote that you are allowed to promote or is all of your upcoming stuff things that you still can't actually say just yet um the next thing that's coming out is enhanced which is a film my brother did and myself and that's probably coming out next year in the u.s i I think and uh it's a sequel It's a loosely based sequel of Kill Order, which was the first movie I did. Kill Order is already out on Hulu um, right now. Um, And then Enhanced will be next year. So if you're interested in seeing some great Canadian action content, 100% Canadian made, um, check out Kill Order. And then if you like that, the action in it, then you can check out Enhanced next year. And then where can people find you if they want to follow you on your socials? Since, you know, we talked about this, got to, got to plug the socials. Uh, Chris Mark two X is my uh, Instagram handle. And I do a lot of my posts and training clips and promotional clips I've done uh, in my career on that channel. That's good. You know, show off like, Hey, look, I'm so, I'm so cool. I'm so skilled. I can, I can do flippy stuff. I'm, I'm not di- I'm not disrespecting your stuff. I'm deliberately saying it to be juvenile because it's yeah. it's funny to me because I like I could never do a flip at all of any kind. You have to like put me on wires and then push me. Never say never. <laughs> That's what I love is the behind the scenes stuff for Charlie's Angels is seeing all the girls on the wires and they're just like flying through the air and they're like, oh, it's so painful, but they like they just throw themselves into it and then it looks amazing. So. I like the wire foo. I think we should bring wire foo back. I don't cool. think there's enough wire foo. Yeah, it'll it'll make its it'll make its round again. It's always like that. It's like popular and it's not, and it'll it'll come back. Right now it's like like more like hard hitting, you know, like ground pounding, kinda like MMA. It's kinda mm-hmm. like even like uh Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is kinda like a really hot style, I find. Mm. We wanna like the raid, we want it gory, we want it bloody. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I'm no glad that we were able to record with you and not have it completely crash like it did last time repeatedly. For those who don't know, it was a disaster, but we're glad that he came back and, and we didn't scare him off. So thanks for being here. <laughs> thank you for having me. It was fun. I'm glad you had fun because I yeah. was like, okay, we got to nail it this time. <laughs>
No, it's good. I got it's snowing right now in tr- Toronto, so I wouldn't be doing anything. Got a snowstorm coming. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs>